Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you all to the Sorry about that. I want to welcome you guys all to the webinar on the topic of bankruptcy. I'm so excited that you guys are all here sharing your morning with us. Uh, my name is Jana Adams, and I work on the California Transition Assistance Program team here at CalVet. And we have a really great webinar scheduled for you guys today. Um, first off, we're going to give you guys just a little bit of information on um, what CalVet is up to these days and who we are and what our team does. And then we have Michael Jones here, and he is going to talk to you guys all about bankruptcy. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to give you guys just a couple quick housekeeping tips real fast. If for any reason you guys get um, kicked off or have to leave, feel free to use that same Zoom link that you used to sign on just to jump back on. This webinar is going to be recorded and you signing on to the webinar does give us permission to record the webinar. Um, by recording it, we're able to get this onto our website or onto our YouTube channel here in a couple weeks. So that way this information will be saved and that way you guys can um, view this whenever you'd like to get the information again. Um, we're going to be giving you guys a lot of information today. So Danielle, my um, coworker, she is going to be putting all the a lot of links and different information into the chat field. Um, as you can see, she's probably already started sending some messages there. We do ask if you guys have any questions today that you guys utilize the Q&A tab. Um, you just click on that. You can ask your question in there. You're more than welcome to ask your questions anonymously. Um, or um, if you guys are asking questions, just make sure um, that you are keeping the questions um, a little bit more um, basic. So if it has to do with your um, exact personal um, experience or a question that you have personally, um, you are always more than welcome to contact Mike Jones um, after the webinar and talk about your specific situation. But any questions that we do have, we'll go over at the end of the webinar. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, um, I'm on the CalTAP team, California Transition Assistance Program. And what we're here to do is, um, our well, basically what our goal is to inform and connect veterans of all eras to their earned federal and state benefits. And the way we do this is by giving information through our five pathways. We have core curriculum, education, employment, entrepreneurship, and service providers. And all of this information is located right on the CalVet website. I'm gonna show you all that stuff in just a couple minutes. Um, oh my goodness, I didn't mean to do that. There we go, here we are. Um, but after the webinar is over, we do really want to keep in touch with you guys. Um, so if you guys have any questions for us, you can always email us. Um, we do ask that you email us from a non-DOD email address so that way we can keep in contact with you. Um, but our email address is caltap at calvet.ca.gov. Um, check us out on our webpage. As you can see the QR codes um, up on the top right, uh, the one on the top left that has CalVet in there, that's going to be um, our um, CalVet webpage right there. Um, and then we also have our Instagram, our Facebook, and our YouTube um, channel um, pages on there as well. Um, you can attend webinars and get more information. Um, there's a survey that we would love for you guys to fill out at the end of the webinar. Let us know how we did and give us um, any feedback would be really great. Um, but yeah, keep in contact with us. That way we can um, keep giving you guys lots of benefits and resources. Um, this is how you find us online. You can just Google CalVet. This is the CalTAP page from the CalVet website. As you can see, all the core curriculum, education, employment, entrepreneurship, service provider, all the pathways I mentioned, um, all the information is right there on our website. And also if you click on archives there that's circled at the bottom, that's where you're gonna find our previous webinars that we have recorded on there. Okay, so this is a wonderful laundry list of all the different benefits that um, you can access while living here in California. So if you guys have any questions on any of these benefits or resources, I would love to give you all the details that you have on them or answer any questions for you. Um, feel free to give us a call at any time. You can always email us and we'd be more than happy to go over these benefits with you. This is our veterans resource book. I have mine handy right here. Um, this thing is like gold, you guys. It has all of your benefits, all of your resources listed. Um, it has all the qualifications you need to sign up for them. So it's a really great resource. We're gonna go ahead and put the PDF version in the chat for you. And then if you have any questions on it, feel free to contact us. Uh, this is a really great website to go see in case you have not been there. It's va.gov. It has lots of really great things you can do, including the healthcare aspect. Um, where you can contact your doctor, you can make, um, you know, appointments and then view them online. Um, you can do the uh, video appointments, things like that. So 
lots of really great information on this website. And then here's all of my contact information. Um, all of my contact information will also be on the question and answer side at the end. But um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Annette, who is our local interagency network coordinator in the Central Valley. And she's going to let you know what she does for veterans. Good morning, everyone. My name is Annette Wolliver. I am the link. But basically what I am is I'm one of the field reps for the state of California. And actually, I'm one of eight. Next slide, please. So you can see that CalVet has divided the state into eight regions. Each color is a region with a coordinating link. So eight of us work together to assist current and prior military service members and their families. And we know the state and federal benefits, but what we do is we work within our individual areas to build up additional resources um, with the nonprofits and some of the collaboratives in our areas. So I'm the Central Valley Link. I cover Stanislaus Kern counties, eight counties, uh, representing about 144,000 veterans. Um, and we work to, as a team, as the eight of us, because we all have different skill sets. Um, one's a lawyer, uh, one is currently serving a reservist, um, right, a retired military. We've had someone who's in, been in the congressional area. Um, I work for the Employment Development Department. So we can all reach out to each other um, if we have issues within our own communities and we can assist them. Next slide, please. So what we do is we provide outreach to service members, veterans, and their families. And we do this by going to DOD installations. I go to the Moore Naval Air Station about once or twice a month, maybe. And that way, we, active duty service members are made aware of their benefits before they even separate. Um, we also go to community colleges. Um, in many cases, these are recently separated veterans. Um, once again, we want to make sure that they're aware of what their community has to offer. And we make referrals and work directly with established service provider networks. And that's by attending these collaborative meetings throughout all my eight counties. Um, we assist with local emergencies. Um, we've been very um, active in assisting uh, military service members when it came to the fires we had here in California. Um, a year and a half ago, I was actually deployed to the Tulare County um, LAC Local Assistance Center. Uh, over a period of three weeks to assist ve veterans who were evacuees from those fires. Um, and in some cases, not only did they lose their properties, but they lost all their paperwork. Um, that DD Form 214 is a very important piece of paper and it's really the gateway to benefits. Uh, so make sure that you have a copy available or one that you can get to. Um, and but, but by working with the County Veteran Service Officers, um, and our, uh, we were able to get copies of their DD Form 214. And then also working with the home loan agents from CalVet, we were able to get certificate of eligibility so they could go forward with either a VA or a CalVet home loan. And if they had a CalVet home loan, we could assist them with that insurance paperwork. Currently, us eight links are helping uh, headquarters answer the calls that go into 1-800-CALVET. Um, so if I get a call from Klamath Falls or from San Diego, because I know the state and federal resources, I'm usually able to assist them. If not, I can contact the link in their counties and we can get those additional resources that they need. And then we provide leadership and advocacy to local communities by staying in touch with our partners, our, our network system, um, that they're made aware of benefits, um, any changes or updates to benefits. And we could also identify if there's any gaps in benefits that we could send that, that information to headquarters. Next slide, please. So getting connected to your benefits is what I do, and it's very important to me. Um, I take it very uh, personally because um, I'm kind of the poster child for that. I served in the United States Army from 1975 to 1978, uh, separated, used my GI Bill, got my degree, used the VA home loan, and I thought that's pretty much it. Um, but it wasn't until 12 years ago when I started working for the state of California that I could file for compensation. So I have a service-connected disability, which leads to additional benefits. I'm also enrolled in VA healthcare. So your needs may change over time, and a lot of these benefits do not expire. But when it comes to employment and training, the Employment Development Department actually has dedicated staff uh, that can assist you with either your uh, resume preparation, interview skills, or just getting you connected to employers. And they're co-located in the America's Job Center of California. These AJCCs have the tools that you can use. At no, and all of these agencies are at no cost to you um, as far as employment training and, and getting your California state benefits. 
um, but they have the scanners, the fax machines, the copiers, everything that you can use. Um, California state benefits, well, that's what CalVet is all about. Um, and every state has different benefits and different eligibilities. And it's the county veteran service offices. These are our boots on the ground. Uh, there are eight of us links. Uh, there are 56 county veteran service offices throughout the state of California. Um, they can assist with filing for compensation and pension, college tuition fee waiver paperwork, DMV. Um, they're there. Uh, they're trained by CalVet. Um, so we rely on them uh, immensely. Uh, they can help you with both state and federal benefits. And healthcare, we should be mindful of our healthcare during this time. Um, as I said, I'm enrolled in the VA Medical Center uh, here in Fresno. That's where I'm stationed. Um, and I, I uh, encourage you, if you're, if you're considering it, enroll in VA Healthcare. You can call them and ask for eligibility, or you can do it online. Um, and um, it's been great because over the last two years, I've been able to stay in touch with my uh, medical providers via VA uh, Telehealth and VA Connect. Uh, so it's very important that you keep going to see your physicians. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my contact information. If you remember nothing else, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, even if you're not in the Central Valley, I'd be more than happy to assist you with whatever questions you may have um, or get you in, in contact with the link in your area. I want to thank you for your service and have a great day. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Annette. And you guys, as she said, she is just an incredible resource. So please reach out to her if you guys have questions. And even if she's not in your region, she can get you connected with the link that is, or you can always call us too and we can get you connected. Um, so next up, we have Michael Jones with us and he has a lot of really amazing information. So whenever you are ready to start, Michael, you're set. I'm ready. All right, so here we go. Everything you've ever wanted to know about bankruptcy in 35 minutes or less. Just kidding, uh, sorta. Um, so bankruptcy is an extraordinarily complex area of law. Uh, it's pretty much all that I work in. Uh, I'll tell you that I'm very military friendly because I am a military. So I'm a judge advocate in the United States Army. And um, I do a tremendous amount of help and work for veterans and, and military personnel and their families. So if you have a need, Chances are pretty good. I'll be able to help you. All right, but let's let's see. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go through and tell you kind of how the bankruptcy world works, and then we're going to go through and take a look at some very specific things that relate to misunderstandings that people have. Um, when we're done here this morning, you'll probably have a better grasp of what a bankruptcy case can do and what it cannot do than even most lawyers do. And again, the reason for that is because it's a very specialized field. So uh, the more complicated a person's financials are, the more essential it is that they have a bankruptcy practitioner that really knows what it is that they're doing. Um, so let's go through. All right, so next slide. So here's, here's the way the bankruptcy world works. Okay, so the bankruptcy code is divided into chapters and each chapter has a particular purpose or goal. So you've probably heard these chapters, but you may have no idea what they are. So there's there, and these are ones that are available for consumer cases. Um, there are some that also are available or used mostly for business cases, but, but they're available for consumers too. Okay, so here's what they are, just really, really, really brief. A chapter seven case is a liquidation case. That's where we go to our creditors and say, Okay, guys, take all of my property that's not otherwise exempt, sell that property, get a big pile of money, use that money to pay creditors as much as you can. Whatever they get is all they're going to get, and any balance still remaining due just gets wiped out. And when we wipe out debt in a bankruptcy case, we call that a discharge. Okay, now, most people, their heart starts pounding really hard when you talk about selling material, selling property. But the important part to remember in that is the only thing that gets sold is what is not exempt, okay? We can exempt a gigantic amount of property in California, so much so that most cases that are Chapter 7 cases are what we call no asset cases. Okay, more on that here in just a minute. But just recognize that most chapter seven cases, you don't lose anything, but your debt still gets wiped out. Okay, um, there are chapter 11 cases. 
a chapter 11 case is one where we go to our creditors and say, guys, I have a whole bunch of debt and I simply cannot pay it all as I'm obligated to do right now. But I have a plan and we create a very customized plan to deal with the circumstances of the particular person filing the case. Chapter 11 cases are very, very complex and they also tend to be very, very expensive. Um, so if you're hiring a lawyer to do these cases, a chapter seven case probably costs about two grand. A chapter 11 case probably costs about 20 grand. And then there's chapter 12, that's for farmers and fishermen. Okay, I'm in Orange County, California. We have both of those here. Um, so if you earn more than half your income from farming or being a fisherman, commercial fisherman, you can follow chapter 12, similar to a chapter 11, but much less expensive and much more streamlined. And then there's chapter 13, which is also like a chapter 11, kind of, except it doesn't have as much flexibility to it, but it still enables an individual to make plan payments over a period of time so that they can then catch up their finances and get everything back on track. Okay, let me simplify it even more. In a chapter seven case, that's usually used by debtors that have a lot of consumer debt and no assets at risk of being lost. They also typically are not people who are behind on mortgages or car payments. If you have property at risk of being lost, or if you need to catch up your mortgage payment because you've fallen behind on that, then you're typically gonna go with a chapter 13 case. If you have unusually complex situation, then you would go with a chapter 11. So again, because I recognize the audience, people that might be contemplating such a thing, let me just tell you, if you hire a lawyer, a chapter seven case, probably about two grand, a chapter 13 case, probably about $2,500 or so to start the case. And then you're gonna make making monthly payments for between three and five years. Chapter 11 and 12 are probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Okay, next slide, please. Now, another kind of big picture moment. When you file a bankruptcy case, from the minute that case is filed, automatically what goes into effect is what's called the stay. The stay prohibits creditors from engaging in any collection activity against the debtor. So if you have a foreclosure underway, and you wanna stop the foreclosure from the minute you file your bankruptcy case, that foreclosure comes to a screeching halt, it stops. The same is true regarding litigation. So suppose you've been sued by a creditor, it comes to a screeching halt. Um, also, collection phone calls, mean letters, entries on your credit report, all that stuff comes to a screeching halt from the moment that a bankruptcy case is filed. There are some exceptions, but they're very rare, okay? So the idea is we'll freeze everything so that we can maintain the status quo while we get everything nice and orderly for the administration of the case, okay? And that's why you've got that last little blurb there on the slide. The system is designed to be fair to the debtor and creditors, okay? So that's why they stop creditors from engaging in collection activity. Because if they didn't, if one creditor went and got real aggressive and then seized a bunch of property so they could pay their debt, but the other creditors didn't do that and they're not getting paid, it's not fair to the other creditors. So they just stop everything so that everything can all be um, administered fairly. Okay, the end result that we're looking for in a bankruptcy case is at the end, which is a discharge. A discharge means that all of your debt that is eligible for a discharge is wiped out, meaning the creditors can no longer ever make a demand for you to make payment on that debt. It's, a, it's gone. What typically happens is the, the creditor, when a bankruptcy case is filed, um, will open up their records, change the amount due to zero. They just go ahead and do it at the beginning because they know where it's going to end. They change the amount due to zero annotate the file as being in bankruptcy, close it, and then that's the end of that, okay? Most consumer debts. So credit card debt wiped out, 
um, and medical bills wiped out. <laughs> They're just all, it's just all gone. Past due obligations to a former landlord gone. So um, a bankruptcy case in most instances will get the debtor back to zero. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, so when we talk about chapter seven, and I say that in these cases, you liquidate you, you, the trustee, the bankruptcy court sells your non-exempt property um, to pay your creditors, but it's only what's not exempt. Here's what I mean by that to elaborate more. Okay, everything you own is property. So don't think of property as just real estate. It's everything you own. And uh, sometimes I talk to people and they say, well, I don't own anything. Yeah, you probably do. You probably own your clothes. Like just looking at my picture right now on the video, I have clothes, I have glasses, all those are property. Okay, there's a bunch of books behind me, that's all property. So if we took a person's property and we took all of it and sold it, then you just have a naked person standing around out in the, out in the, in the road somewhere. He wouldn't even have a barrel around him because they would have sold the barrel too. And it's not realistic to think a debtor could get a fresh start with that. So the system allows people to always keep a certain amount of property, and we call that exempt property. Now, in California, we have two different lists that you can rely on for your exemptions, and it has to be one or the other. So one of those lists is designed to protect equity in real estate. And in California, uh, where uh, it's now a dynamic number, it changes depending upon what county you live in. But it's essentially an exemption equal to the median home value in that, in that area up to a maximum of $600,000. So in the coastal regions here in Southern California, it's pretty much always $600,000. That's what it is here in Orange County, for example. So if you own real estate, we can usually exempt enough to, to protect the equity in the property. Um, if you don't have any real estate, you use the other list. And the other list enables us to exempt like thousands of dollars of equity in cars, thousands of dollars of jewelry. Um, uh, we can re protect retirement accounts up to an amount necessary to support the debtor, which is like a million dollars or so. And then uh, there's a spattering of other things too. But then on top of that, we can exempt about $30,000 of anything we want. Okay, so usually just to kind of help consumers, I ask this question. If you were to have a garage sale and sell absolutely every single thing you own to where you were standing naked in the street because you sold your clothes and all, would you get more than $20,000? And for most people, I found the answer is no. So what that tells me is you could file a chapter seven case, exempt all your property, and then still not lose anything, but have all your debts forgiven that are eligible for a discharge. So uh, I, I usually ask about $20,000 so that I've got a $10,000 margin of error. But as we're preparing the case, we'll know for sure. But for most consumers here in California, we are able to do that. Now, here's the thing. Creditors hate Chapter 7 cases because they don't get any money. They get wiped out, but they don't get anything. So as a result, the bankruptcy system requires the debtor to engage in this test called a means test. Okay, um, next slide, please. With a means test, you have to show that your income is low enough that you really can't pay your debts. It's not just that you just don't want to, it's that you really can't. And the means test works to where if, you're, if your income for a family of your household is equal or less than the median household of that size in California, you're good. If it's more than that, you have to take some extra steps to prove that your particular circumstances should allow you to file a bankruptcy case anyway. How much is that amount? Let me give you the, the most common ones, okay? For a household of one, your household income needs to be lower than $62,900 or so. If it's a household of two, $83,400 or so. A household of three, 92,700 or so. A household of four, 
$106,000 or so, and a household of five, $115,000 or so. If you're under that threshold, you'll likely be eligible for a Chapter 7 case. Okay, next slide. So what if your income's too high? Then what you're likely going to do is a Chapter 13 case. So a Chapter 13 case is either used for people whose income is too high or their circumstances are such where they need to do things that you can't do in a Chapter 7. Like you can't catch up your past due mortgage payments in a Chapter 7 case, but you can in a 13. So if you got behind on your mortgage and you need to get it all under control, you file a Chapter 13 case, present a plan where it catches up the past due amount, and then now what you do is you make your mortgage payment plus your a little bit towards your past due payment so that somewhere between three and five years down the road, everything converges, your past due part is brought current, and then you're making your payments current now too, and so everything is all good. Okay, so that's what happens in a Chapter 13 case. How much your payment is, is going to vary based on how much income you have and how much the formula that's in the bankruptcy code requires you to pay. Okay, next slide. A Chapter 13 case also will be available to help people to discharge some debts that would not otherwise be eligible for a discharge in a Chapter 7 case. More on that in just one second. But just like a Chapter 7 case has an income limit, a Chapter 13 case has a debt limit. So your debt limits are your non-secured debt, like credit card debt, medical bills, stuff like that, has to be less than about $465,000. And your secured debt, that'd be like mortgage payments and car loans and stuff, have to be less than about 1.3, almost $1.4 million. So as long as your debt load is a bit under $2 million and you, you're okay as far as how it's divided between secured and unsecured, you can drive on with a 13. What happens if your income is too high for a seven and your debt is too high for a 13, then you have to do a chapter 11 case. And sometimes that does happen, okay? So uh, chapter 11 cases, like I said, very complicated beyond the scope of our time here today. Um, complicated enough, by the way, that very few bankruptcy practitioners even practice this area. So maybe 5% or less of people that do bankruptcy work do chapter 11 work, okay? So let's talk about the discharge, next slide. So a discharge means that all of your debt that's eligible to be wiped out is in fact wiped out. There are some debts that are not eligible for a discharge, okay? And then there are some debts where the effect of it kind of rides through anyway. So what happens if you have a car loan? Well, the discharge will forgive your personal liability on the loan, but if you want to keep the car, you still got to pay for it because the lien from the creditor is still enforceable. And the same is true with mortgage debt. If you have a mortgage, your personal liability will be wiped out. But if you want to keep the real estate, you have to continue paying the lien. Otherwise, the, the lender is going to foreclose on the lien. There are some circumstances where we can remove liens from property. But those are a lot more complicated. And when those arise, we tell people say, hey, you may have an option here that's worth doing. Okay, next slide. Um, also, in a chapter seven case, let me tell you when the discharge enters. If you file a chapter seven case, that's the one where we sell our property, except we usually don't because everything's exempt. The total length of that case is about four months. So you file the case, you have a meeting with your creditors about a month after you file, and then after that you're waiting another two months or so for some deadlines to expire. And then usually through just an automated computerized process, as soon as you're eligible for a discharge, the court enters that discharge order 
And then two or three days after that, your case is closed and you're done. Okay, so a typical chapter seven case takes about four months. A 13, chapter 13, takes somewhere between three and five years, depending upon how much income the debtor has. Most of the coastal regions of California are five-year plans. Some of the inner areas, like the valley areas or the desert areas, may be three-year plans. Okay, next slide. Some debts are not eligible for a discharge. And here I can make it really simple for you. The debts that are typically not eligible for discharge are ones that are incurred because of misconduct of the debtor, either regarding a particular debt, like you defrauded someone, you beat them up, you vandalized their house, something like that. It was misconduct on the part of the debtor on a particular debt, or it's misconduct in the bankruptcy case in general, such as you're hiding assets, you're really a closet millionaire and you lied under oath, those kinds of things, okay? If none of those things happen in your case, you'll just have a regular plain vanilla case. Chapter seven will go through discharge in four months. Chapter 13 case, three to five years, and you're all good. And I can usually tell you whether it's likely some of these things are gonna happen. There are other debt obligations that are typically not dischargeable, such as family support obligations, tax debt, if it's really recent, the tax debt line is if a tax debt is for a year, a tax year more than three years ago on a return that was filed more than two years ago, and the assessment from the IRS is more than about a year ago, then you're good. If you didn't file a return, or it was only filed recently, or the assessments just happened because of an IRS audit, then probably not. Okay, so again, a bankruptcy practitioner will be able to evaluate that and determine whether or not your tax debt is eligible for a discharge. Okay, next slide. And next slide again. Now, some of those, some of those debts that are not eligible for a discharge that relate to a particular debt like a creditor says you defrauded them in some way. Those debts are gonna be discharged unless the creditor brings a lawsuit inside the bankruptcy case to stop it. How often does that happen? Not very often. One reason why is unless the debtor is gonna eventually have more property, you know, like they're, they just had an unusual set of circumstances, but they're gonna get back on their feet and be successful again. The creditor is probably not going to pursue it because they're just spending more money to chase after a dream for getting paid someday. So they usually don't. Sometimes they do, but they usually don't in consumer cases. All right, let's talk about myths, things that people misunderstand about bankruptcy. Next slide, please. There's a ton of misunderstandings that people have. We've already addressed a lot of it. And now you, you should have a much better understanding of kind of what can happen and what cannot happen. But let's go through some of the real specifics. Next slide. Here's the top reasons or myths that people have about bankruptcy cases. They just don't, they just think these things are true, but they're not, okay? So we'll talk about each of these in more detail as we go. But a very, very, very common question that people ask me is the first one, which is, how is this going to affect my credit? Well, when you file a bankruptcy case, what, what it's going to probably do some, some pretty massive impact on your credit immediately, unless your credit's already awful, in which case it might actually improve it. So if your credit score was like 500 and something, your credit score is probably going to go up as a result of filing a bankruptcy case. And the reason for that is because the balances on all of your accounts is gonna suddenly go to zero because they're gonna get discharged. So if you had like hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and you were showing slow payments and no payments on all this stuff, and now suddenly it's all gone, chances are pretty good that your credit score is gonna go up, okay? 
So uh, the other part is the further in time you are away from the filing of a bankruptcy case, the less impact it's going to have on your ability to obtain credit. Okay, so right after you file, big impact. Three years later, less of an impact. Five years later, really less of an impact. Seven years after you file a bankruptcy case, the individual accounts that are affected by your filing fall off your credit report as being obsolete data. So the further in time you are away from the filing, the less it will matter, okay? But that's for most creditors. Creditors are the ones who ultimately decide whether to extend you credit or not. And so how they particularly look at your circumstances is kind of up to them. One more comment on that, and then we'll go into more depth on the de on the myths. People who ask me that question, how will this affect my credit? Usually need to remember, okay? Credit is just another word for debt. Debt is the reason why we have that conversation in the first place. So don't be in a big hurry to go out and get new debt, okay? So I can get, usually get you back to zero, but don't start digging the hole again right away or you're gonna end up regretting that. Okay, next slide. So there's a, there's a myth, myth out there that people file bankruptcies because they are physically irresponsible. Sometimes that's true, but it's by no means always true. The most common reason why people file bankruptcy cases are unexpected medical calamity, an unexpected job loss, a family emergency, a family law disaster. These are all things that cause financial ruin, and they may not be related in any way to physically irresponsible things on the part of the debtor. They're things that happen that are outside of their control. Now, free tip for you. One thing that is inside your control is voluntarily accumulating debt. And I will tell you, a debt that is commonly taken on that is devastating to most consumers is student loan debt, okay? Student loan debt is not your friend. That is one of those debts that is non-dischargeable in bankruptcy with rare exceptions. So if your problem that you've got is that you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan debt, a chapter seven bankruptcy case will probably not help you with that because it's non-dischargeable. We can oftentimes help that with a chapter 11 case, but that's a real expensive proposition and it doesn't always work. So be very cautious about accumulating debt on purpose. Okay, next slide. But people have problems in bankruptcies that they weren't expecting. On the screen's a list of a whole bunch of relatively well-known people who have filed bankruptcy cases in the past, including a former president, Donald Trump. Walt Disney filed one uh, in the past. A lot of musical performers have done so. So have sports celebrities. So it's way too broad a brush to say, no, 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 people do this because they're just irresponsible. Okay, next slide. Also be aware that creditors, when they charge interest on loans that they give to you, what they are charging you for is they're assuming the risk that you will not pay that debt obligation. This is important for people who have questions about whether it is immoral to file a bankruptcy case. I would tell you it is not. The, the basis of it is biblical. It's based out of Deuteronomy 15 in the Bible called the Year of Jubilee, where every seven years, all debts were forgiven. And so uh, as a result of that, that's the biblical basis for it. Our country's founding fathers were very spiritually minded people. They took that principle and embedded it in the Constitution. As such, you have a constitutional right to file a bankruptcy case. So uh, some people believe it's, it's immoral for them to do so. My guidance on that then is then don't do it. Um, if you believe that um, it's okay and permissible with your moral basis, it's certainly legally permissible and you can drive on with that. The economy is designed for these to occasionally occur. All right, so 
So you should be um, not overly concerned about that particular issue. Okay, next slide. Some people also are of the misunderstanding that you can only file a bankruptcy case like one time. Um, no, you can, you can file bankruptcy cases more frequently than that. Uh, next slide again, please. You can file a bankruptcy case and receive a discharge in a chapter seven every eight years. You can file a chapter 13 case and receive a discharge about every four years and then complete the plan and receive your discharge. You can file a chapter 11 case and receive a discharge as often as you file them, uh, as long as you continue to be a good faith debtor. So a, uh, a bankruptcy practitioner can help you determine your particular situation as to whether or not you're eligible to file right now, but make sure that you'll be eligible for a discharge when you file. Otherwise you'll go through a lot of time and expense and not receive the benefit of it. So make sure you do that. There is one consequence for being a repeated filer. Remember I told you about the automatic stay that prevents creditors from taking collection activity against you? If you file two cases in a year, the second case, the automatic stay is only good for 30 days unless you ask the court to extend it. And, and then if you file three cases within a year, there's no automatic stay at all, okay? So uh, you generally don't wanna file your case until you're ready to do it. Okay, next slide. This relates back, the free house myth, relates back to what I was discussing earlier, which is that your personal liability will go away on secured debt, but the lien remains in place. So if you have a car loan or a mortgage debt, even if your personal liability is wiped out, you will still want to continue paying that debt so that you can uh, retain the property. If you don't do that, the creditor is likely gonna be able to request or just drive on with their foreclosure once your bankruptcy case is concluded. So again, if you've got something underway where you're trying to protect property that's being pursued by a creditor, a foreclosure or a repossession or something similar, you're not gonna find the relief that you want in a chapter seven case, you're gonna need to probably go with a chapter 13 or an 11 or a 12. Okay, next slide. This relates again to the, oh, I'm gonna lose all my property. No, probably not. Um, if you um, are like most people in California, you'll be able to exempt all of your property and not be at risk of losing anything in your bankruptcy case. Now, sometimes people do lose property in bankruptcy cases. It's either because they want to or they have filed a case that should never have been filed, like they've got real estate with millions of dollars of equity exposed. Bad idea, okay? So what will happen in those cases is that the bankruptcy system will sell that property, give you your homestead exemption, 600 grand or whatever, and then the rest of that money will go to pay creditors. So if you have an asset with a lot of equity in it, you'll be, be well advised to cautiously consult with a bankruptcy practitioner who can tell you whether or not you're at risk of losing any property. Okay, next slide. Discharge. So as we've discussed, some debts are not eligible for a discharge. Most debts are. The ones that are not eligible for a discharge recent tax debt, student loan debt, most family support obligations, debt incurred by misconduct on the part of the debtor, okay? So um, for most people, they'll be able to discharge all their debts and they won't be at risk of losing any property. But again, you'll wanna make sure that's carefully reviewed before you pull the trigger on that, okay? Now, quick addendum. You can choose whether you file a Chapter 7 bankruptcy case, but you cannot suddenly drop it at will, okay? Once you push the ball, it's going to go, okay? So the adage, the expression that's used in that is you can choose whether you dance with the gorilla, but the gorilla chooses when you stop. So again, cautiously go into a bankruptcy case 
making sure that it's gonna work out the way that you want. Okay, next slide. Here's some misconduct. Um, oh, well, actually, before we get to the misconduct, let me say this too. Sometimes debtors are under the mistaken idea that you can choose which debts and which property to include in a bankruptcy case. That is incorrect. A bankruptcy case is an all or nothing proposition. You must disclose all of your property. You must disclose all of your debts and then allow the system to manage all of your affairs efficiently as the way the system is designed to work. Okay, because remember, it's designed to be fair to you and the creditors. That means it's comprehensive. Okay, next slide. All right, here's misconduct that you do occasionally see. And that is that people figure, hey, I'm going to file a bankruptcy case anyway. Let's go on a spending spree. And they go down to Best Buy and buy a whole bunch of really cool electronic gadgetry and expensive things or take fancy vacations knowing that they're just going to wipe out their debt anyway. That's fraud. Okay, so the system is designed to protect the honest but unfortunate debtor. Incurring debt knowing that you're going to file a bankruptcy case and wipe it out is not honest. Okay, another thing that sometimes people do is they say, well, I'll give away all my property and then I'll file a bankruptcy case. That also is not honest. So I'll give you a rule of thumb. It's the last little bullet there. Anything you can think of that will enable you to wipe out your debt and not have to lose property that would otherwise be lost has already been thought of and is illegal, okay? That's the general rule. Now, I've done this for about 30 years, and I have yet to see anybody come up with something that the system's not already contemplated and, and made illegal, okay? So um, just play the system the way it's supposed to be played. I disclose all my debts. I disclose all of my assets. I exempt what I'm able. What I'm not able to exempt is available to be used by creditors, uh, by, the, by the bankruptcy system to pay creditors. Um, in exchange for that process, I receive a discharge of my debts. Okay, next slide. So, the goal in a bankruptcy case is to get you back to zero. There are some situations that a bankruptcy case will not fix. And one where you have a structural deficit in your budget is one. Like if your income is only $1,000 a month, but your living expenses are $3,000 a month, the bankruptcy case will get you back to zero but then next month, you're going to be $2,000 behind again, and then $4,000 the month after that, and then $6,000 the month after that. A bankruptcy case will give you the opportunity to get everything back to zero and get rid of those obligations that you simply cannot afford on your income. So a bankruptcy practitioner, again, will be able to help you create a plan and structure that will work for you. All right. There's everything you've ever wanted to know about bankruptcy, including myths and misunderstandings in about, I guess, 35 or 40 minutes. Let's see what kind of questions we have. Are there any questions that we have? All right. As we're checking on that, I just want to say thank you so much, Michael. That was, I mean, incredible information. And um, hopefully everybody just got a lot of out of, a lot out of that. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions. Danielle, you want to pop on and, and check that out? Yeah, so we actually didn't have any. I didn't see anything in the q and I'm checking the chat right now. Okay, I see one. Um, this, this question is, what is lien in the property? Okay, fantastic. So what a lien is, is that's where you give a creditor the right to take property away if you don't pay for the obligation. The most common is when a person has like a car loan. So suppose I go down to the Ford dealership and say, hey, I wanna buy this Ford Mustang. And the dealership says, okay, um, that'll be $30,000. Well, I don't have $30,000. 
no problem, we'll give you a loan. You pay us $600 a month for however many months it takes to pay it off. And then you agree that if you don't pay the debt, you have to give me back the car. The right of the creditor to take back the collateral, the car, is what's called a lien. You do the same thing with real estate. So if you get a mortgage on your house, the deal is, hey, if I don't pay you, you can sell the house in order to pay the, pay the mortgage. So that's what a lien is. Liens are most common on cars and houses, although you also sometimes find them on jewelry um, and even some home consumer products uh, like entertainment centers that you may have bought at Best Buy and stuff like that. All right, thank you. So, oh, were you, sorry, were you about to say something else? Michael? I was just gonna say anything else. Oh, any other questions that popped up either in the chat or in the, I don't see anything in the Q and A, but. Not yet. Okay. Hey, well, I see that I'm on the screen there. So you see my information. So I'm the M. Jones and Associates guy. Like I said, I am a JAG officer with the army, very mm -hmm. military friendly. So if you've participated in our, our webinar or you're watching the recording of it, and it's like, wow, what about my particular situation? Send me an email. And chances are pretty good, I'll be able to help you figure out what you might be able to do, okay? So usually what I do when I do intake interviews with people is we talk about what, a bankrupt, what the bankruptcy world looks like, and then we get your specific situation, and we apply it to that world so you get an idea of what a case for you would look like. And I'd be happy to do that if you need help with that. Thank you so much, Michael. That's really great. Um, well, um, if other questions come up, you guys still have time to ask those and we'll go over them. Just interrupt me, Danielle, if something comes in, but um, this is all of our contact information from Annette, our local interagency network coordinator, and then Danielle and I, um, those are our email addresses, um, or you can always reach us at the caltap at calvet.ca.gov. And then we always like to add the veterans crisis line um, on our contact info. You never know who will need that information or um, you know, when yourself will need that information. So we always like to have that on there. Um, Annette, did you wanna say something? I saw that you popped Yeah, I on. did. Um, um, yeah. Uh, you're a great resource, Michael. I loved your presentation. I thought it was unbelievably, it was very easy to understand. Um, yeah. And I get calls from veterans throughout California who have questions about these types of things. Can I refer, give them your contact information? Yep. Okay. So you worked around the state. I mean, you're not in an individual area. Um, well, I'm in Orange County, but the okay. magic of the bankruptcy world is, is bankruptcy is a federal system. So it's Title 11 of the U.S. Code. Mm -hmm. So anywhere a person files a bankruptcy case, you use the same laws everywhere. I actually am licensed in multiple jurisdictions and I do cases in multiple states. So I have another case that's going pretty hardcore in Georgia right now. <laughs> so, but um, because COVID kind of changed the, the way the courts operate, thankfully, I don't really have to go to Georgia for hearings anymore. I just do it on Zoom, just like we're doing now. So I can Very probably good. help anywhere in the state. <laughs> well, well, thank I mean, you. That, yeah, that, I mean, that just makes you, I mean, more of an incredible resource than you already are that you, um, that you have multiple jurisdictions. That's great. Um, well, I still don't see any other questions, so I'm going to move on to our next slide, but if more questions come in, that's absolutely okay. Um, this is just information. Um, you guys can click on the QR code for our survey, um, or the survey link will be in the chat. Um, we do appreciate your feedback. This gives you guys a chance to um, also um, suggest any webinar topics that you might like to see us cover. So we cover all kinds of things, and in fact, we have lots of webinars coming up here. Um, one more for the end of the month tomorrow, and then we have a whole bunch happening in May. So um, these are some of the topics that we have happening in May. You can sign up. They're all free, of course, and um, they'll all be on Zoom. Um, you can sign up through our Eventbrite page, and they'll also be recorded too. So they'll end up on our website. Um, we usually put them on our website, but then also they're going to go to our YouTube channel. So these are our QR codes for the website, Calvet at the top left-hand corner, and then Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Um, that's our phone number. If you guys call that number, which is also on the back of the Veterans Resource Book, it's located down here, 
um, that number actually gets you to a live human being. Uh, most likely it will be someone from the Caltap team like Danielle or myself or one of our links like Annette answering the phone. And if we can't answer your question, we usually can figure out who to refer you to um, that will actually answer the phone. So um, there's our phone number, we've got our website there and then also um, our email address on the Caltap team. So um, Danielle, have any other questions come in? Just wanna check one more time. Nope. All right, well then I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much, Michael, for coming on and giving us all the information about bankruptcy that we could ask for. And Annette, um, of course, thank you so much for being a great resource as well. And um, we hope to hear from all of you soon. Um, don't forget to call us if you have any information and uh, we look forward to talking with you in the future. Well, thanks a bunch. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye.